Good evening. I'm Richard Meserve, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all to a capital science evening. Years of debate have brought an undeniable consensus, underscored by this year's Nobel Prize selection, that the Earth is in the midst of climate change. It has become abundantly clear that carbon dioxide levels in Earth's atmosphere are increasing, that its ice sheets are melting, and that global temperatures are rising. Unfortunately, the problem is only getting worse. A paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences just two weeks ago by Carnegie scientist Chris Field and others indicates that the rate of increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide is accelerating. That is, concentrations over the first six years of this century are growing roughly 30% faster than in the 1990s. This is driven by three factors. First, carbon dioxide emissions are correlated with economic activity, and the recent expansion of the world's economy has yielded. It is not widely known. The carbon intensity of the world's economy has increased, largely driven by the fact that carbon fuels are used less efficiently in China and India, the world's fastest growing economies than in the developed world. And finally, the scientists observe a troubling decline in the efficiency of the sinks for carbon dioxide. Human-caused increases in carbon dioxide concentrations have resulted in the poleward displacement of westerly winds in the Southern Ocean, which has served to reduce oceanic CO2 uptake. Human activities have brought about droughts in mid-latitude regions over the past several years which in turn have contributed to a weakening of the terrestrial carbon sinks in these regions. The declining effectiveness of the sinks for atmospheric carbon dioxide confirms that we may be faced with some very unpleasant surprises as we proceed with our experiment with planet Earth. Although the computer models provide an indication of what we might confront, experience shows that the models have tended to underestimate the impacts and there may be effects that are not included in the models, a simple result of the fact that the Earth is complex and in changing critical global parameters beyond the scope of the historical record, we confront significant uncertainty. Some people conclude that there is little we can do to change the situation, and that instead of wasting money trying to reduce emissions, we should simply adapt to a warmer world. But our guest tonight, Professor Richard Alley, is convinced that we should and can do more. It is the Earth's very unpredictability, he says, that is the best reason why we should mitigate our carbon impact. His work with ice cores has shown that past episodes of climate change have been abrupt and dramatic, and he believes that unless we put human ingenuity in the profit motive to work in fixing our climate woes and in finding new energy sources, we may confront a very difficult future. Dr. Alley is the Evan Pugh Professor of Geosciences at the Pennsylvania State University. He is considered one of the world's foremost glaciologists. He received his MS and BS degrees in geology from Ohio State and his PhD degree also in geology from the University of Wisconsin. His research focuses on the climatic records, flow behavior, and sedimentary deposits resulting from large ice sheets. He has spent many field seasons in Greenland, Antarctica, and Alaska, gathering the ice cores that are the foundation of his work. Dr. Alley has had numerous advisory roles. He chaired the National Research Council by Senate and House of Representatives. His popular account of climate change and ice cores, the two-mile time machine, was chosen Science Book of the Year by Phi Beta Kappa. Today, it is required reading in many Earth science classes around the country. Professor Alley is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. His awards include the Seligman Crystal of the International Geological Society, the first Agassiz Medal of the European Geosciences Union, the Presidential Young Investigator Award, the Horton Award of the American Geophysical Union, the Easterbrook Award of the Geological Society of America, and the Faculty Scholar Medal in Science at Penn State. In December 2008, 
he will receive the American Geophysical Union's Roger Revelle Medal. Please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Alley. Well, thank you. A pleasure to see so many friends, and I hope some new ones. And Dr. Meserve, it turns out, is one of the early polar heroes, having worked in Greenland. This is a little, little north and a little higher from where you were, Dr. Meserve. But at any rate, this is central Greenland, midnight July 4th, um, and we're sitting up there on two miles of ice. And I will come back to there a little bit later, thanks to some very good people who have helped fund us. Let's start with a difficulty, and then we'll come to what I hope are some nice things eventually. Okay, so um, we're, we're, some of us are going to have a nice dinner later, and if there's chocolate cake for dessert, we may even go over our 2,400 calories. But um, in round numbers, if you eat 2,400 calories a day, your energy use, including the plows and the fertilizers and the lights and everything else, your energy use is in round numbers about 240,000 calories per day. Each of us is, is benefiting from not having to spend our summer hoeing corn. It's really nice, actually, that something plows for us. Um, and it's equivalent of having 100 people doing our bidding. Now, the truth is, if you had 100 people doing their bidding, they'd spend most of their time taking care of themselves. So it would be more than 100 to do this. And we like this, you know? If I were to keel over right now, you'd have an ambulance here almost immediately. You'd have something breathe for me. And it would all be fossil fueled. Okay, so there's where we stand. This is, this is a challenge for us. Now, we have tried various ways to generate that energy. I drove down from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania started out with really big trees, and then we cut them all. And basically, every tree in the state got whomped down, and when they grew back, we cut them again. People talked about the great Pennsylvania desert. We virtually drove all the wildlife out. We have elk now because we imported them from the Rocky Mountains. I am from Penn State, home of the Nittany Lions. There are no Nittany Lions in Pennsylvania. We drove them out. We could not run a modern or an ancient industrial economy on burning trees. They didn't grow fast enough. Now, it's getting dark this time of year, as you know. And if you've ever tried to read by firelight, it's not as easy as you might imagine. And so when you want it in Pennsylvania, or here for that matter, when If you had to actually bring home all those gallons and gallon jugs, it would be a different world. But of course, you carry them in your car. You burn it and you add a little oxygen from the air, and we see that oxygen dropping a little bit to make the CO2, and that makes CO2. And then the CO2 just blows away and we can't see it. I want you to do a mental image for me now. Imagine if you could see the CO2 coming out of the tailpipe. Suppose that it were packaged the way our transportation system used to package things, okay? It comes out at horse ploppies, all right? Now, it's a, it's a pound per mile. You know, you're driving down the road, okay? Now, 
We would cover every road in America an inch deep. Now that's the ones out in the desert and everything. You can just imagine what 270 would look like coming in from Fred. <laughs> um, and you can just, we know this, okay? Now this will end. The oil, I spent one summer once working for an oil company. They're really good, they're really smart. They know where it is. Um, if you go and drill a hole in your backyard, you will not get rich. Um, you know, they know where it is. And at the same time, there's a huge number of other people in the world would really like a hundred folks doing their bidding too. And um, I keep having to change this slide, right? We pay $80 a barrel, well, okay, $100 a barrel. And let's be honest, if you were a poor person and you wanted, wanted energy so that you didn't have to hoe corn all summer, can you afford a hundred bucks a barrel? And the odds are no. Let's, let's be really honest. We have bid the price way up right now. Um, and so this will run out and at the same time more people want what it is and they have troubles getting it. And so there's sort of a size of a, a problem facing us, if you would. Now, let's, let's make it worse before we make it better. Now we're gonna go to global warming, okay? If we burn all those fossil fuels and then we change. We have very high confidence now that we will make the change in a world which is really different and which is harder for us. Okay, so let's walk through a few things on this. Um, here is um, some curves from ice core data. A thousand years ago on your left, start up here on the upper left. A thousand years ago, that much CO2 in the air. 800 years ago, 600, 400, 200, whoop. And that's both instrument and ice core data right there. It does work, okay? We have changed the atmosphere in a variety of ways. Um, this one will come back to us. This is acid rain, and in fact, we cleaned that up a little bit, and you'll see this dip here again in a minute. But are we changing the atmosphere? Yes. The atmosphere really is changing, and it really is us. We know how many tanker loads of oil there are. We know how much CO2 is coming out of the tailpipes. We can see that just about half of it's in the air and the rest of it's gone into the ocean and elsewhere. But the balance says, this is us. We are huge compared to volcanoes or other things. Furthermore, if we were completely wrong, if somehow we had no idea how many oil tankers there are, a volcano doesn't burn anything to put out CO2. When you burn fossil fuels, you're taking oxygen out of the air. And we see the little drop in oxygen which is needed to supply the CO2 that's rising. Now, we're still going to be able to breathe. We won't run out of oxygen. But we see that it actually is something burning from the oxygen. We see that it is something biological from the 13C. We see it as something old from the 14C. This is our CO2. And there's really no question on that anymore. We are changing the atmosphere. Is the climate changing? Okay, the IPCC, which I was fortunate enough to be a very small part of, they are cautious. They calibrate everything. They put likelies and unlikelies and possibles. And when they looked at the climate, they said warming of the climate system is now unequivocal. You don't hear that word very often from scientists. It's unequivocal. You see it from thermometers whether the thermometers are in the city or out of the city. You see it from thermometers taken in the air, in the ocean water, in the ground, taken aloft on the strings of balloons in the troposphere. Um, you see it from satellites looking down at the troposphere. We see it, places that are getting more snow have less snow at the end of the, the winter. Um, places that are getting more snow, the glaciers are melting. Um, once you see the general picture, I can show you a specific. Now, always be careful about an icon unless there's a generality. Fundamentally, every glacier on the planet has lost mass over the last hundred years, with very few exceptions. Um, this is one. This happens to be a dramatic one. Muir Glacier in Alaska, 1941, photographed here. 2004, Bruce Molnia of the United States Geological Survey goes back to the same rock with almost the same camera lens, and he looks at the glacier. Okay. Okay, so it, it, it actually is getting warmer, okay? The bigger question then, it's getting warmer, we're changing the atmosphere, are these related? Okay, they almost have to be. It, it, in World War II, the military realized that the exhaust of a bomber flying way up there makes it a target. And you could shoot down the other guys and they could shoot you down. But when you're seeing that hot exhaust, you have to see it through the water vapor and the CO2 and the methane. And it's not 
obvious to do that. And so they bought a bunch of really bright physicists and they said, understand radiative transfer. And CO2 makes it warm is sort of like if I drop this laser pointer, it will fall down. It's virtually unavoidable. The physics say it has to be that. Furthermore, the fingerprint of what's going on is CO2. Okay, I will show you the time trend in the next two slides. There are things like the space trend. We've been watching the sun, the sun is not getting brighter, okay? But suppose we were wrong and the sun were getting brighter and all our measurements are wrong. Okay, you turn up the sun, it warms down here, it warms up there. You turn up CO2, it warms down here by holding the heat down and it cools up there. What's happening? It's warming down here and it's cooling up there. Okay, the fingerprint is CO2 now with very high confidence. If it were the ocean, and El Nino mines a little bit of heat out of the ocean to put it into the atmosphere. If we were mining heat out of the ocean, the ocean would be getting cooler, but it's getting warmer. Okay, and you can do this with anything. It's, it's us with, with high confidence now. Okay, so let's do it this way. This is the 2001 figure. I'll show you the new one in a minute. 1860 is on your left, 2000 is on your right. In each panel, the red is what happened. This is the global mean surface temperature. This is about as far back as you can go with a global average from thermometers. What you see is a whole bunch of jumps and bumps and wiggles and a general upward trend. The gray band in each panel is a model output. And just look at this one. You take what you know about the climate, you put it in a computer, and then you tell the computer just what you want it to know. And in this case, the computer has been told what we know about nature. Volcanoes blocking the sun, um, the sun changing its brightness. And you tell the computer what nature has been doing, and it says, hey, we had a little ice age. It was cold. And you know, the computer thinks it was cold, and it was cold. And the computer thinks it warmed up, and it warmed up. They just coincide. Sometimes the sun and the volcanoes go together, and sometimes they go against each other, and they happen to go together. The volcanoes quieted, and the sun brightened. And recently, if nature has been saying anything, it's a very, very slight cooling, but it's warming. Okay? Now, just go down to the bottom one. Let's tell it what nature did and what humans did, including Right after World War II, we had really dirty smokestacks. We had a lot of acid rain, and that blocks the sun. And there wasn't much CO2 up then. And then as we cleaned up that acid rain and the CO2 accumulated, we switched from a cooling to a warming. So you tell it what nature did and what humans did. Red happened, gray is what should have happened, according to the computer. Those are the same curve. Okay? It used to be mostly nature, it's now mostly us with high confidence. Now you can even do a little better than that. This is the 2007 figure now. We've broken it out by continent. Antarctica, not quite enough data to go back this far, but the black curve in each case is what happened. The blue curve is what nature did, and the pink is what nature and humans did. And you will notice that what happened is outside of the nature band in every case, and it sits right in the nature plus humans band in every case. So is the warming us? Yeah, high confidence there, okay? Now, we're just started. We're just barely started, okay? What you just saw there was a few billion dollars. It was a lot of scientists, a lot of satellites. Satellites are not free. Um, it was a lot of people doing a lot of very hard things. And the reason it was hard is because the effect of CO2 so far is not that much bigger than the effect of everything else. We've got methane, we've got sun, we've got volcanoes, we've got all sorts of things that are in the picture. And I want you to do a mental for a moment. I, um, I, I've had fun coaching soccer, and we started when the kids were little. And if you've ever watched a bunch of five-year-olds playing soccer, you know, it's just, it's sort of almost Brownian motion. You know, they they're just, they're just kick, 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 and somebody's watching the posies, and kick, 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 kick. But if you watch long enough, you realize that one of the kids may have figured it out, and she's kicking a little bit harder, and eventually you figure out which way it's going, but you have to watch carefully. And that's sort of been what I just showed you for the climate. So many things have mattered. And it's only recently that the CO2 is sort of showing up as pushing it towards something, okay? The problem is 
Those other things generally are not expected to grow like CO2 is. You put particles up and they fall down in, in two weeks. You put CO2 up and what doesn't immediately go in the ocean stays for centuries to millennia. And so what we're going to do is we're going to grow one of those five-year-old soccer players into the goalie for the U.S. national team. And the rest of them are going to be five-year-olds. And it gets easier as we go. So this is the IPCC version. CO2, red bar is warming, or yellow or orange. CO2 is up here, big red bar. But we've had methane, we've had nitrous, we've had halocarbons, we've had tropospheric ozone and cooling from dropping out the stratospheric ozone. We've had land use changes, we've had black carbon on snow, we've had particles, we've had particles changing clouds, the sun has changed a little bit. The net is sort of the same as the CO2. But these are all the soccer players that have been kicking that ball on various teams in various directions. And this one is not that much bigger. Now, this next big picture is not exact. This is just an illustration. None of the rest of these is expected to grow a lot. And the CO2 is going to do that if we keep on our path. And that, in turn, is going to come to dominate. And so, so, you know, the past has been hard. The future, unfortunately, gets much easier. Um, this is a different way to look at it. A thousand years ago, this much CO2 in the air. 800 years ago, 600, 400, 200, that's what we've done. These are various possible futures, different scenarios put together by the IPCC about how the economy grows and how dirty things are and so on. Things to notice. This only goes to 2100. The world does not end in 2100. Every one of these curves is going up when it crosses 2100. In every one of these futures, the rise to come is very large compared to what's happened. Burn it all. They're still not sure exactly how much all is, but this is 1,000. We might go to 1,800 or 2,400. We're out of this room. We can't show it to you on this plot. We're just barely started on this path. The models that get the history of climate change right, here's the warming to date, and these are various futures. There's uncertainty about science. There's more uncertainty about what people will do. In every future, the change coming is very large compared to what's happened. In every future, it's going up across 2100. The world does not end there. Um, the warming so far is sort of a degree. And a degree is small enough that if, if you're a scientist paying attention, you know it. If you're not paying attention, you probably have not been kicked in the teeth by this. It's not huge. The change that's coming will become evident to everyone. Okay, now, nobody cares. Right? We don't care what the global mean temperature is. We care about things like what does it do to us and other living things. And there will be good and there will be bad. Um, but there's a bunch of things that as you look farther out, the bad comes to dominate in the projections. Most of the models project drying in the places where we now grow a lot of our f food. Uh, sea level rise virtually unavoidable as the ocean warms and the mountain glaciers melt. Um, tropical disease is controlled by a lot of things, and public health matters and screens and so on matter, but there are tropical diseases that, that sort of don't like to be frozen, and if you quit freezing them, that gives them a leg up. Um, things in the past have migrated. They've never migrated with us in the way. You get these glorious biodiversity hotspots, you change the climate, the things need to move, how do they get where they have to go across a sea of parking lots and corn? Uh, so ecosystems become a real thing. Nobody has a real strong handle on what happens to tropical cyclones, hurricanes, but um, we're giving them more fuel. You know, they run on hot water, and so if you give them more fuel, they, certainly there's an expectation, at least more likely than not, that the ones that do form will get bigger. Um, there's, in the summer, in the winter, my tomato patch is damp all winter. In the summer, I get a thunderstorm, and two weeks later, I'm watering. You get more flood and more drought, and there's an expectation for more variability in the hydrologic cycle from flood and drought. Okay, now. People have tried to quantify this. This is not as easy. All the uncertainties in the science are simply magnified as you go into economics. But, but what you find is, is projections of looking out decades to a century, this grows to a few percent of the economy per year. Not the end of the world, not, but, but it, one percent of the economy is, is sort of $500 billion a year. So when you say a few percent, you're tossing around trillions 
And so that's depending on how you want to spin this, this is a few percent of the economy, or man, that's a lot of money, and that's lives and livelihoods and so on. And it keeps coming out that sort of right now we couldn't fix it. We don't know how. Uh, at the practical, on the, you know, I'm not going to walk home. Okay, so, um, so right now we couldn't fix it, but, um, but with a, a few decades of serious work, we keep coming up with a number that's something like 1% of the world economy to fix this. Not the end of the world, 1%. Okay? And because one is bigger than a few, you, you start to see where we're going here. Um, and um, it's, you know, people have tried this experiment, you get a range of answers, but some of the leading answers are if you just want to optimize the economy, you start investing now, and then you ramp up the investment with time. And there's some other issues that come up. I, I work with some people who are ethicists, and um, if Nancy Tuana from the Rock Ethics Institute were here, she'd say, okay, now wait a minute. Okay, if you've got winter so that the snowstorm closes down the airport, that costs. If you've got air conditioning so you can actually work in a Washington summer, and um, you've got bulldozers, so when the sea level rises, you can build walls and things move things. Um, a little bit of warming doesn't cost you much, and it might even help. Okay. A lot of warming becomes costly, but if you actually have winter bulldozers and air conditioning, a little bit of warming is no big deal. If you're lacking those, if you're Bangladesh and it's already sort of uncomfortably hot, and when sea level rises, what are you going to do? There's, there's no good in this. And so, um, so you start out with most of the warming being caused by people who have winter bulldozers and air conditioners. And so initially, we're doing it to somebody else. Eventually, we start doing it to ourselves as well. Um, the head of the IPCC says, it's the poorest of the poor in the world who are going to be the worst hit. And it is an interesting thing. It is absolutely positively illegal for me to come poop in your front yard. But I actually can drive down here and blow my CO2 and change your climate. Okay, now, this is science. It is not revealed truth. It could be better, it could be worse. Unfortunately, and as you heard Dr. Meserve say, if this is wrong, we probably were just optimistic. It's probably worse than what I just showed you for a number of reasons. I showed you smooth curves. The world is not smooth, okay? And I'll, I'll walk you through a couple of these. I'd point out down here from, from Bill Nordhaus, um, the uncertainties, you put them in your economic model, and they actually are a strong motivation for action, not for inaction, okay? So look at this one first. Down here is projections out to the end of this century from the IPCC from various models with various uncertainties in them. And what you'll notice is there's sort of some central warming, and the warming might be a little less or a little more or a lot more. And this typically comes out that there's a skewed distribution so that there's a central estimate. It could be a little better or a little worse or a lot worse. And you don't usually find a lot better. It only sort of shows up for very good physical reasons. This makes it even a little worse. If you look up here, people give you the global average warming at the end of the century. Okay, well, the globe is mostly the Pacific Ocean. And what you'll notice if you look up here, the redder to purpler it is, the more it warms. The, the global average is sort of what you get right where these two colors meet. And what you'll notice is essentially nobody on the entire planet gets that small of a warming. Everybody, this is like Wobegon, we're all above average because the land warms more than the ocean. So when you hear people talking about the global average warming, that's almost meaningless. We get more. Now let me take you to Greenland very briefly. This is Greenland. It's a glorious place. If you ever get the chance to go, I very strong, these are... Uh, trying to avoid the bugs, actually. You go up on the ice to get away from the bugs down on the tundra for the caribou there. The muskox, right there, same size and shape as a minivan. They corner better. Um, okay. The Arctic fox showed up in the middle of Greenland when we were up there, you know, 200 miles from the nearest rock. Okay. Some of you have seen this picture, but this is a great day in Greenland. Um, you'll notice... Um, <laughs> yeah. The newspaper is actually a month old at this point, but that really doesn't matter. Okay. Um, this is a good day in Greenland. This is a bad day in Greenland. Um, 
Julie Palais, who's down here, worked up there in Greenland with us, one of the heroes of this. Um, we were drilling ice cores. This is the ice core drill. Um, and we were studying the ice core. And this is uh, Wanda Kapsner and Kurt Cuffey's on it studying the ice core. And I want to link it back to this. This is South Greenland. This is the cathedral at Valsi. And the Vikings, if you remember the story, they settled in Greenland when it was warm. Most of the world is sort of hot enough that if you don't have air conditioning in the summer, it's uncomfortable. A little of the world is sort of too cold to be optimal. Greenland is part of that little part of the world that's too cold to be optimal for our economy. It may be optimal for many things, but not for our economy. And so it was actually easier for Europeans to settle here when it was a little warmer. And when it cooled off, they sort of lost it and they abandoned it and they left. All right. Now, what got them? This is a temperature history. 10,000 years ago up to today, just look at the green curve. A broad arch that's linked to features of Earth's orbit and wiggles that are linked to features of volcanoes and sun and ocean currents. And the Vikings settled right over there where it was hot, and the Vikings lost it when it was cold. Okay? That was a climate change that was big enough to affect people living on the edge. And the last time it really warmed up, it didn't come smoothly. It staggered. Now, those projections I showed you assumed that the world is coming smoothly. But what if, perchance, something like this happened? It turns out that every time this happened, it got really, really dry in the monsoon regions, where sort of a couple billion people rely on rainfall. We're about 90% confident that this won't happen in our future. But we're not 100% confident. You melt Greenland, you freshen the North Atlantic, just maybe something like this is out there. <clears throat> and the last time it happened, it wasn't pretty. And so when we show you those smooth curves going into the future, that's likely. But it's not guaranteed. Right? Um, this is a record of how wet or dry it was in, in the Great Plains. Today is on your right, 2,000 years ago on your left. The Dust Bowl, you know, it sort of wonked out things out there in the Great Plains. That little red down right there, that's the Dust Bowl. Okay. Now, when it was warm and the Vikings were settling in Greenland, notice these little red downs here. Okay. If this is the Dust Bowl and it did what the Dust Bowl did, these are not in the projections. But are we sure they're not in our future? Okay. Now, let me take you to Antarctica. Um, some Adelie penguins, some chinstrap penguins, uh, a Gentoo penguin on a Gentoo penguin nest. Uh, happy with Del Seal. And, um, and let me show you oh, some Penn Staters down at the NSF uh, US Antarctic program doing, doing science. And let me show you this one, OK? We're down here at the Antarctic Peninsula, the banana belt, OK? Been warming there recently. Not much warming farther south, but it's been warming here in the banana belt. And the Antarctic Peninsula is this thing on the left, OK? Out on the right is the ocean in black. Uh, NASA image here, and in between is the, the ice shelf, the flying buttress that's holding back the ice behind it. This thing formed 10,000 years ago as the ice was shrinking from the ice age. It's been sitting there for 10,000 years as of January 31st, 2002, getting warmer. These are the little funny colors on here are, are meltwater ponds that are, that are sitting on the surface, wedging the cracks open. And these are rocks that there's friction with that holds back what's behind it. Okay. Now let me get rid of the labels, and then let me get rid of the ice shelf. Okay. This is five weeks. Um, it just sort of fell apart. Once it fell apart, you could have driven your boat through this, this little tiny stuff in here, uh, big icebergs. And after this happened, it lost the friction over here. It lost the friction over here. And these things sped up as much as eightfold. Uh, Chris Schumann, who's down here, has been watching them thin and um, documenting that this is putting ice into the ocean to raise sea level. Now, there isn't much ice behind that one. But all these other green things have ice behind them. And so one gets just a little bit nervous about this, that maybe if you get it too warm, that you can take out this. What's behind it is a lot more water. Right? So um, in 2001, the IPCC said, wow, we're uncertain about ice sheets. We're not sure what they'll do. But our best guess, they won't change how they flow. They'll get more snow, 
and they'll melt a little bit more around Greenland, and the net's not much. If anything, they'll grow just a little bit. Okay? And to, then what happened? Well, they changed their flow. And, and very much quicker. We thought we had a century, and they, they did it before the next report. And in 2007, if you actually read the report, it said, models used to date do not include the full effects of changes in ice sheet flows. A basis in published literature is lacking. Understanding is too limited to provide a best estimate or an upper limit on sea level rise. Okay, now our projections actually don't have this sort of no upper limit in them. Um, this is uh, red, th this is not a prediction, this is a scaling. Red is sort of West Antarctica or most of Greenland. Um, no one believes that we could get to this in decades. This would be at least centuries by anything we understand right now. But we might, this century, within some decades, get warm enough to commit ourselves to this. No one has yet agreed on a worst case, but I think most people who were thinking about this would say a worst case would be notably worse than this, maybe threefold more than this. Greenland, West Antarctica, and coastal East Antarctica, or something like that. So our projections of the future sort of don't have this in it, but it might be out there. And so now let me go back. You know, you drive in by car, and, 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 and what happens? You get stuck in traffic, right? And you turn on the radio, and... and Captain and Tennille are singing Muskrat Love. And, um, <laughs> okay. um, or you get in the car and the best thing is, you know, you, you, you just drive down. There's no traffic. I don't know how that's possible down here, but there's no traffic. And you, you've got the, the Beach Boys Festival and the Beatles Festival going on at the radio and everything's great. And what's the worst thing? You get in the car and, and the semi runs over you. And it doesn't matter who's singing on the radio. Um, and... Um, we in the developed world are most likely is usually on the good end rather than the bad end. You know, we sort of expect things to work most of the time. And unfortunately, I see that as, as the future from, from global warming, which is that there's a central estimate. And don't kid anyone, it could be better than that. And it could be worse than that, but there really are semis. There really are ice sheet collapses. There really are North Atlantic shutdowns. There really are 100-year droughts. We may miss them all but we're not sure, okay? So let me offer a couple of opinions and we'll, we'll swing through to the end here. Um, is this the end of humanity? Are we doomed? Are we screwed? Come on, we're weeds. We're the greatest weed that nature has ever invented. We're not smart enough to kill ourselves off, um, okay? We figure it out, but we do know how to mess up things that we really care about. We knew, do know how to make life hard enough for ourselves that we're not investing in wonderful institutions like this, in libraries and museums and art and music and so on. We do know how to make our lives that hard. Um, I don't know how. At $100 a barrel, how are we ever going to make energy cheap enough that poor people can afford the good things that we have? You know, I, I, maybe there's a way to do this. There's bright people thinking about it. But, but without facing up to it, without attacking it, I personally don't see how we get there. Um, and I just keep thinking, you know, sometimes you try to solve a problem and you solve it and then some. You know, IBM set out to, to help businesses a little bit. And look, I'm showing this on my computer. You know, sometimes you set out to solve a problem and you need a solution and you actually leapfrog to something that might even be better. Okay, so let's do a little bit on money again. Back to where we were. I showed you this before, but um, the cost of solving this with serious investment, with serious estimate effort, typically come in at something like 1% of the world economy per year. Um, and that, could it be two, could it be a half, yeah. Could it be 10, probably not. Could it be a tenth, probably not. It's sort of order of 1%. And that's sort of $500 billion a year. But you know, right now, you know, when I drive home, I'll put some gas in the car and I'll buy gas. It isn't obvious in this solution future that I'll be putting gas in. Maybe it'll be hydrogen, maybe it'll be electricity, maybe it will be something else, maybe I'll just, uh, telecommute to talk in. Um, you know, I don't know what it will look like, but realistically, solving this is, is talking about changing a few percent of the world economy. 
So if you want to actually optimize the economy, you want to make money, the, the economics are pointing towards investment now. And that investment puts maybe a few trillion per year in play that somebody can make. And I don't quite know how to get around that particular number. Um, and then you just keep thinking about this, that, that as we've solved problems in the past, those have become parts of our economy and parts of the economy we count on. At London, they used to take what they did overnight and dump it out the window in the morning. Yeah, guardy Lou, you know, and dump it out there. And, and then you go to plumbing. Would we go back? You know, I, I just don't think so. I really don't. This is part of the economy. And um, so, so sometimes these solutions actually do work and they get to the point that, that we sort of like them and they grow to something that was even bigger than, than what we had before. So let me su summarize and I'll show you a pretty picture and we'll quit. Okay, what do we know? All right. The science is really good. It's not revealed truth, but it's really good, okay? Human fossil fuel burning and other activities are changing the composition of the air. High confidence causing warming, sea level rise, other climatic changes. Our decisions control whether the future changes are really big compared to what happened or not. There are plenty of uncertainties. There's no, I don't see any credible alternative to that first statement. Um, when you put the uncertainties in, Far from being an excuse to avoid action, they become a goad to action because they're so skewed on the bad side. Okay? And this is part of this very, very much bigger picture of the energy we enjoy, the energy that other people would like, and the business that can be done in getting that energy for them. And so I will leave you with a, with a picture. Um, I actually am an optimist on this. I have the joy of teaching. And I do know that we've got a lot of really smart people. Uh, most of them are going into business. Um, <laughs> and I would just love to see a few more of them going into science and technology and engineering. And, uh, but at any rate, education. But uh, at any rate, I will leave you with an iceberg that may be here for our great, great, great grandchildren and a rainbow that just may be a good sign for them. And thank you for inviting me. Well, uh, Professor Ali has obviously presented us with a, a great challenge that not only the United States needs to confront, but countries all around the globe. Uh, and it is a very uh, important subject that he has discussed that I think all of us are going to become increasingly enmeshed with in the years ahead. We have some time for some questions. Uh, there are some microphones in the, uh, here on either side. And let me invite anybody who has a question for Dr. Alley to come to a microphone and, uh, and, uh, and give a, we'll give you a chance to have a few issues resolved. Please. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I've seen this in other presentations. And I'm wondering if part of the problem of convincing the public uh, on this that, that we are actually warming up is that what I've heard a climatologist call the break in the mid, uh, uh, middle of the last century. I grew up in that. And there had been this spectacular warm-up uh, into the 1930s up to about 1940, and since 1980. In between, according to your graphs and others I've seen, there's a leveling or even a sort of decline. Uh, and during that period, there was a lot of speculation on cooling. Now, is it possible you mentioned that, that you would have this one, two, You'd add the carbon dioxide, and the, uh, then you would have this, the increase in clouds, and that would offset it for a while. Is that what was happening? Yeah, okay. that's, that's the preferred interpretation. Uh, there's, there is very strong warming in, in the early part of the century in the far north, much less strong warming elsewhere. So that, that warming is, is greatly amplified in the far north. But um, the preferred interpretation is that nature is in there, but then that our smokestacks were part of it. If you, if you were to turn up, start in a perfectly natural situation and turn up industry, what you will do is start generating CO2. And what you saw is we've made enough change in CO2 over a century that it shows up now. And you would start generating particles. And the particles are there right now. They are mixed very quickly. And the particles really only last about two weeks in the air. And so if you just start from flat, 
normal climate, and you turn up industry, what you will see is a cooling and then a warming. And the warming will take some decades to get it at the, it depends on how much you turn up CO2, industry from CO2, but it will take a while to come out. In exactly the same way, actually, if nature were to turn up volcanoes, Initially, they primarily are blocking the sun and you'll get cooling, but if you came back a few million years from now, the CO2 would have built up and you would get warming. So sometimes you turn the knob and it, and it does one of those, and that's the preferred interpretation is it actually did one of those. Please. Uh, Professor Ali, <clears throat> recently Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist leader, issued a statement of concern based on, as I understand it, statements by the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. And in it was claiming that animal agriculture, when all the pieces are put together, contributes more to global warming than the transportation sector. Have you heard that claim? Do you have a comment on it? Yeah, I've heard the claim and I don't know how to parse it out. Um, there's, there's certainly if you are feeding animals, uh, hauling them around, it, you know, if you're carrying an animal from here to there, is that transportation or is that animal agriculture? So how you count things will surely matter. Um, there is um, probably wetlands, uh, rice paddies are more important, but there is methane that comes uh, from belching bovines and, and that is a contributor. Um, and so, you know, if, if you start making lists of things that can be done, the list will become very long and looking at that will almost certainly be on the list. Um, my guess is it probably will not be on top of the list, but it, it yeah. Yes, um, I, I've heard the argument that uh, if we have these brief periods of warming and extended periods of ice age, and we're overdue for an ice age, so Maybe we should be thankful for all this CO2 because it's the only thing keeping us from freezing solid. How do you answer these people? Right. Um, we're actually not overdue. Let me see if I can do this, if you can hear me away, because this works better this way. Um, the ice ages, it's just fascinating, right? The ice ages happen because of features of Earth's orbit. And I want you to imagine that my head is the Earth and you're the sun, okay? And the North Pole is right here. Now, if you're the sun and my North Pole sticks up perfectly straight, I will never get a sunburn on my bald spot because you're not illuminating me. But you know that it's tipped over a little bit. And so um, because it's tipped over, I can get a sunburn on my bald spot. Now, what happens is it nods. A nod takes 41,000 years. And when it nods over, my North Pole is getting more sun and and the equator less. And when it nods back, my North Pole is getting less and the equator more. Okay? So, and there's a couple others. There's a wobble that takes 19 to 23,000 years. And then the shape of the orbit goes from being almost round to a little to squashed and back over 100,000 years. And so when I was a student, we thought that we were due for another ice age, but we forgot something, which is the shape of the orbit goes from almost round to a little squash to almost round to a lot squash, to almost round, to really squash, to almost round, to a little squash, to almost round, to more squash, and there's a 400,000 year modulation of the 100,000 year cycle. Now what that does is the orbit now is stuck at almost round. And because it's stuck at almost round and the knobs are where they are and the wobble is where it is, we can't get sunshine low enough in Canada to let the ice survive the sun. And when they put that 400,000 as well as 100,000 and the 41,000 and the 19 to 23,000 into the models, the next ice age is either 20 or 40,000 years from now. And so if you actually believe that cranking up CO2 to stop an ice age is a good idea, you'd say save it for 20 or 40,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not good, okay? It appears that we're not good. Easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll throw a couple of things at you, but the final question will be, what is everything going to look like according to your expectation? In other words, in terms of a decent scenario, what would it look like? The points I'm going to bring up is that you have to do so much investment before you get a return on a lot of the things that have to be changed. 
We have to change people's behavior, uh, technology, and, and the distribution of everything. If we're one-fourth using, you know, I mean, if we're one-sixth using one-third, that can't go on. So the final point is I get back to is, what are things going to look like? What do you see in terms of a time frame, in terms of a decade, two decades, three ge decades, if we can do this decently? Yeah. Um. Right, Nixon declared war on cancer in, what, early 70s? And cancer death rates finally fell sort of 30 years later. Um, big complicated problems take, take decades, not years. And so I would see this as being decades, not years. If I knew what it would, and, and I'm, I'm not being glib. If I knew what it would look like, I would be a wealthy person because I'd put some money into the right pockets and I'd know where to go. Um, and I don't. I, I don't think I know how to pick the winners. Um, if, if people get serious about this, and getting serious may be if it matters to them personally, either because of ethics, either because of religion, or because of pocketbook. If people get serious about this, there is absolutely no question that there's a huge number of things on the table that can be done. Um, that conservation is really cheap energy to start with. You can't do it all that way. Um, uh, nuclear probably puts its nose back into the game. Uh, solar, wind, you know, you, you just start looking at this and there's so many things on the table, energy being so pervasive, that you just sort of see this seething mass of ideas and something will come out of it. And, you know, like I say, I, I think that if people care about it, fairly soon that you come back in 30 or 40 years and you see a really different different setup. Uh, if they don't care about it soon, it will still be somewhat different because, you know, if, if prices stay up, people are going to start changing. Um, but I just don't know. I, you, you ask somebody else to come back down here and chat about what it will look like. Um, but I think that most of what we do will be involved at some level. I have... Uh, read some, uh, some studies uh, by the USGS which suggest that the uh, sea level was about 30 meters above where it is today. I believe this was based upon some uh, uh, studies of uh, seashells found along a scarp all, along the eastern seaboard. Uh, this was about the end of the uh, Pliocene, early Pliocene, uh, late, uh, uh, late Pliocene, I suppose. Uh, could you comment on that? And I have one other question I've read also of uh, mechanisms by which the sinks, which you mentioned earlier, could be augmented, that thereby speeding up the uh, absorption of the CO2. Yeah, so um, sea level, the broad picture, um, the dinosaurs live on a world with no ice. So really hot ICO2, crocodiles on Ellsmer Island up by the, the, the North Pole, and basically no ice sea level very high. And so when I was a student, we were studying marine deposits. You know, we drove across marine deposits in Kansas and out the marine deposits out in Utah, and we were looking at all these things and that's what. Um, as you come to colder world, you get more ice and lower sea level. The last time sea level was notably above where it is today, is about 130,000 years ago when it looks like it was about you know, 15, 18, 20 feet above where it is now, uh, probably with contributions from Greenland and the Antarctic, um, and in response to a few degrees of warmth. Um, so, um, so in general, what you find is on the geologic time scale, um, the warmer it is, the higher sea level is. In terms of on putting there's a lot of ideas for getting CO2 and putting it down. Um, you, could, you could take it out of a power plant. You could take it out of the air. Right now it would be a little expensive, but there's a number of people looking at this. If you get it, you either have to pump it into something, down the bottom of the sea, in the spaces, in the rocks, or you have to react it with something. And one idea, uh, which Ken Caldera, who's associated with the, the Carnegie Institution, I believe, and looked at, is um, you take um, your power plant and you put it next to a limestone mine and you react the CO2 with the limestone to neutralize it and then you put that in the ocean. If you put CO2 in the ocean, which is what we're doing now into the ocean, 
it makes it more acidic and it neutralizes itself by dissolving shells or coral reefs or what have you. Uh, and limestone is just an old coral reef, so if you do the dissolution of that first, then you can put it in the ocean safely and it doesn't cause any problem. So there's a lot of ideas that are bubbling around. They certainly won't happen if CO2 is free to release. If I'm allowed to poop in your yard, I won't buy plumbing, and if I'm allowed to dump it in the air for free, I probably won't pay to build a limestone mine. But there's quite a number of ways that one could take CO2 and put it down somewhere, provided it, there's some benefit for doing that. There is a company in Norway now where the, the Norwegians have said, if you take the CO2 that is coming out of your, your gas well and let it up in the air, you have to pay something. And they said, oh, well, in that case, we'll just take the CO2, separate it from the gas we want to burn, and put the CO2 back in the ground, and it's economic. They're doing it. Our last two questions. And you talk about you know, having all these changes and people being aware. And you have to ask, do you have any plans on how to make the public aware of these problems? I mean, all, it's nice that people like us are interested, but the 50, 60 people I passed from the metro on the way here, how are they going to find out? They didn't come here and learn all the things that we did, especially like the young people like us that matter who's going to be impacted the most. How are we going to spread the word then? Yeah, um, uh, the education expert from AGU is here. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, it's a very good question, and um, that's why I'm here. <laughs> it's, I don't have a glib answer. We're all in this together, and eventually we get the word out. But um, it is a very large educational initiative. If we look back, virtually every environmental issue has sort of followed the same path. You have a good idea. Um, refrigerators, okay, you do the ozone hole is one possibility, right? Refrigerators are a great idea. You know, we like air conditioners, we like, I, I like ice cream, I don't know about you, but I do. And um, if you have the old style freezer, and you're, in the, you're working in the ice cream freezer, and the pipe breaks, it's got ammonia in the pipe, and you die. And um, chlorofluorocarbons were a great idea. You know, they're not corrosive, and if the pipe breaks, as long as there's oxygen in there, you're fine. And then somebody came up with this idea, oh, for the ozone hole. And what happened next is just a fascinating study because there were people out there saying, oh, no, there's no problem, you know, and, oh, it's all volcanoes. No, the, the chlorofluorocarbons are denser than air, so they sink, so they couldn't get up there and cause anything. And there was this giant smoke screen of people who were really scared about losing their jobs. And then somebody invented something that, hey, this will work. And we adopted it, and it didn't cost anywhere near what people were talking, and we sort of, you don't hear too much about this, because it's on the way to being solved. It's, it's not done yet, but it's on the way to being solved. And so there's some sort of critical level when you see the path to action, where you know how to get there, and you see the damages that people sort of get. And we did that with the EP, and you just sort of know that they did that with the toilets, too. So I, I presume that we get there. But um, one voice doesn't get there, 10 voices don't get there, 100 voices don't get there, it would be a lot. Last question. Okay, global warming, I guess like everything's getting hotter and like we're having like super hot summers and all that stuff. How come we're still having like this like super cold winters? Aren't they supposed to be getting warmer? Yeah, globally average the winters are getting warmer. Um, but watch it, remember the warming so far is one to three. Well, I mean, like, if we keep going, of course, it gets much bigger, but the warming is one degree. Now, the difference between winter to winter to winter where you live is more than one degree. And so it is still very possible, if you haven't been paying close attention, to not have seen this. You can still, there's a lot more record highs are now being set than record lows, but there still are record lows. Because one degree, you know, the difference between day and night is. 20 degrees, 30 degrees, depending on where you live and so on. The difference between summer and winter is very large. The difference between year to year where you live is very large. It's only if you look at large areas that the warming is unequivocal. As we run this into the future, remember, we have seen enough to be scientifically unequivocal, but it's small. The change is coming if we don't change our behavior, become much, much, much bigger, and then it's evident to everyone. So right now, there's only enough warming to be evident to people really paying attention. 
but it's enough warming to validate our understanding of physics which give us this somewhat alarming result that it will become obvious yet. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening, and please thank Professor Alley for his contribution.